good afternoon to you and my congratulations and thanks to the SAMS committee for the organization of this conference. Uh, in this uh, lecture, we will be walking through a case scenario and we will be exploring together some of these issues on which an injured child requires a CT scan, as well as some of these areas that may be facing the ED physician when you manage a head injured child. So you are on shift when a seven-year-old girl is brought into your ED by paramedics with her head bandage. She was crossing the road when she was hit by an oncoming taxi and she was flung about two meters. So on physical examination, she is crying softly, but she is able to tell you her name. She is able to lift her right hand when you ask her to, and these are her vital signs. Pupils are equal and reactive, and she is kept on a hard cervical collar. After removing her bandage, you notice a boggy swelling over the right parietal region. There is no active bleeding currently. After your long roll, she complains of headache and she vomits once. She then suddenly appears disoriented and seems very agitated. Now, which of the following clinical features is the greatest indication for a CT brain? Is it the headache, the vomiting, the new onset agitation? the dangerous mechanism of injury, or the presence of scalp hematoma. Now before answering the question, we have to understand the delicate play of forces here. In a pediatric child with head injury, they often come in with very subtle complaints and they may not be very clear in their presentation. At the same time, as addressed both yesterday and earlier, we do have to face the risk of the CT scan posing both not just a malignancy risk but a lethal malignancy risk and this has given rise to the concept of ALARA or as low as reasonably achievable. In the more recent studies, we look at this large data linkage study where they followed through 680,000 people exposed to CTs in their childhood or adolescence and they found that the cancer incidence, cancer incidence was 24% greater for those who were exposed. Now for brain cancer and all cancers combined, the incidence rate ratio was greater at younger ages. <coughs> it's another large study that showed that the region was important. So the CT of the brain was significantly associated with the risk of brain tumors, as was CT to the red bone marrow, like a CT pelvis, that was associated with the risk of leukemia. So if we look through the years and the history of this, we realize people through the years have tried to derive clinical prediction rules. Right? First we take the lead from the adult studies and then uh, on to the pediatric clinical prediction rules. So some of this was explored yesterday. I'm going to bite a little bit deeper and then perhaps later we can see why we may have some difficulty applying this into our setup. Now with the Chalice first, this was the first derived rule and it was a large study and touted as safer than the Canadian CT head rule. But this was criticised because it was a bit clumsy to use at the bedside because there were 14 predictors from history, physical examination and the mechanism of injury. The Pecan rule was a landmark study. Why? Because it was a very large Howard study and it was also, they sought to derive clinically important outcomes. So not just any patient, not just any patient with abnormal CT scan, but death, neurosurgery, prolonged intubation, and prolonged hospitalization. And if we look at the derived PECAN rules, we realize that if the GCS is anything less than 15, or with altered mental status, or signs of base of skull fracture, then the risk of a clinically important TBI is present, and therefore CT was recommended. But for any of the other risk factors then, it was still left to the physician's judgment call. The PECAN study was also important because it addressed the pre-verbal group. Now as I mentioned, this group is important because they are terribly sensitive to radiation and they also don't complain clearly. Finally, we have the CATCH rule and this was a smaller study of more than 3,866 patients. Again, with a very small subset of less than 2 years old. This was their rates, only 0.6% underwent a neurological intervention. So if you look at the catch rule that was derived, 
you had high risk factors as well as medium risk factors. And if you think about the three rules, which rule actually rules? Now, in order not to miss a pretty important traumatic brain injury because of the implications of missing it, we need to ensure that the rules have very high sensitivity and negative predictive value. And that's what they do. They do have. Some specificity had to be sacrificed at, 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 uh, for high sensitivity. And if we compare the predictors, we realize that some were consistent, like GCS, altered mental state, as well as signs of base of skull fracture, but others were variable, like vomiting, which is consistent with what we know of children who tend to vomit a lot more easily. So little advice that these three rules will undergo prospective validation in a single population. Others have advised that instead of rushing to CT scan, perhaps we should observe first, because obviously the patients were observed before making the decision on a CT, then the CT rate would be lower. So what about us in KK? We have done a retrospective department audit that we have found that, well, thankfully, our rates of clinically important traumatic brain injury is very low. But if we apply these rules directly into our population, the problem is that we will be putting many patients whom we would not actually have scanned under the CT scanner. So we may actually have increased our rates by about 10 times if we directly adopt some of these rules. Therefore, we have elected not to apply them directly into our patient population, but we are currently doing a funded prospective trial where we have disassembled all the prediction rules and put in our own rules, and we are now tracking the various predictors in the hope that we can put a science to which patient actually requires a CT scan, which requires monitoring and which can be safely discharged from the ED. Now back to the patient. The patient suddenly turns drowsy, she opens her eyes only to pain. On applying nail bed pressure, she adopts a flexing posture, but is unable to withdraw her arm from the stimulus and she moans intermittently. So you decide that she's E2, E3, M3, and you decide you want to intubate her. Now when we look at the analgesic, sedatives and neuromuscular blockade, we know that they facilitate the ability to maintain airway and invasive interventions. We also know that they have anticonvulsant and anti-emetic properties and they do attenuate the effects of pain and stress. The anal blockers prevent shivering and breathing against the ventilator. So we have known for some time looking at the adult studies that where previously it was believed that ketamine was contraindicated, actually the ICP was not significantly different between groups that did use ketamine. Pediatric studies wise, so if you look at the bar of series, he showed that in his group of 30 children, ketamine reduced the ICP during stressful procedures as well as when treating refractory intracranial hypertension. These are your patient's vital signs. What would you do next? Would you consider hyperventilation, <coughs> hyperosmolar agents, or giving anti epileptic therapy? We've known for a while already that hyperventilation does reduce ICP by producing hypocapnia induced cerebral vasoconstriction and it reduces cerebral blood flow. We have seen, however, that studies in mixed populations have demonstrated that it, however, does decrease the cerebral oxygenation and it does induce brain ischemia. So very quickly, we see in the Skippen study that the more aggressively a patient is hyperventilated, the more frequently the cerebral blood uh, uh, flow falls below the ischemic threshold. And in the Curry study, they showed that despite controlling for other factors of severity like, like GCNs, the mortality adjusted odds ratio increased with the number of episodes of se severe hypocarbia. So we know we should avoid prophylactic severe hyperventilation to PaCO2 of less than 30. But in the event of refractory intracranial hypertension, then if we want to consider hyperventilation, we need to make sure that advanced neuromonitoring is in place. Now moving on to hyperosmolar agents. We know that hyperosmolar agents like mannitol does reduce blood viscosity. It has an osmotic effect as well. But we have to remember that mannitol may accumulate in the injured brain regions. 
and if the blood brain barrier is not intact, then reverse osmotic shifts can occur where the fluid will move from the intravascular compartment into the brain parenchyma and worsening the raised ICP. Hypertonic saline, on the other hand, shares a favorable osmolar gradient and a low penetration of the blood brain barrier. It also does treat hyponatremia, which can result from few causes in traumatic brain injury. The side effects, we know, rebound in ICP and the most feared central pontine myelolysis. So looking at the earlier RCTs from Fisher and Sima, we do see that the use of hypertonic saline was associated with a lower ICP and a reduced need for additional interventions to treat the raised ICP. In the newer papers, they were mainly non-interventional, but again they showed that there was a reduction in ICP spikes and increase in cerebral perfusion in the patients that were uh, given 3% hypertonic saline. Now, after you have successfully intubated this patient and waiting for transfer, you wonder about the use of phenytoin as a prophylactic anti-epileptic. Now, post-traumatic seizures, early PTS is defined within 7 days and late PTS beyond 8 days. These are the risk factors for post-traumatic seizures, including a younger age, the location of the plea, like the intraparenchymal hemorrhage, depressed skull fracture, as well as penetrating injury. What is it for us in pediatrics? We know that infants and children have lower seizure thresholds. We also know that seizures may be subtle and challenging to diagnose in critically injured children. Now when we look to the adult guidelines, we see that they do recommend the use of anticonvulsants and the Tempkin study did show that the incidence of early PTS was reduced in the phenytoin group, although there was no effect on late post-traumatic seizures or mortality. This was a systematic review that showed a statistically significant risk reduction for early seizure prevention with the use of phenytoin. And in the Lewis study, again, a reduction in early PTS rate. However, the Lewis study had a very small group with severe traumatic brain injury. There is a randomized double-blind uh, study that was reported by Young. Uh, in this study, they found no reduction in the rate of PTS within 48 hours of injury when they used the drug. However, this study was limited and it was problematic because of their low seizure rates and a very high uh, number of loss to follow up. So currently, most of us would still use phenytoin as uh, PTS, early PTS prophylaxis. Now the hypocom returns 15.6 in your patient. What would you now do? Would you attempt to get insulin? Or would you rather just repeat the glucose in two hours? Again, we look to the literature and we see that different various papers have established hyperglycemia as an independent predictor for mortality together with age group, GCS, temperature and prothrombin time. Others have touted that it is the persistent hyperglycemia that is associated with the increased risk of mortality. We recently submitted a small paper that we did uh, primarily because our intensivists felt that the hyperglycemia story is a bit oversold so when we look at our group of moderate and severe TBI, we realize that while on univariate analysis, the initial hypoglycemia was associated with prolonged ICU state, mechanical ventilation and increased mortality, but when we stratified to the more severe group with GCS of less than 7, this was no longer statistically significant. But regardless, these are mainly studying an association between hypoglycemia and poor outcomes. Uh, they do not study a causal relationship. So what do we have currently? We see randomized controlled trials and a recently published one that showed no difference or no significant difference in the number of days alive and free from mechanical ventilation at 30 days post-randomization. But this was more a general PQ uh, patient population uh, where the patient, more than 60% of them had cardiac surgery. So this is not specific to TBI and we don't actually have clear TBI literature on this. Okay. It is currently 2 hours post-injury and the temperature is 36.4 degrees Celsius. What would you do now? Would you aim to cool the patient or would you want to keep the current temperature? 
And as Jean has already covered early this morning, we do see that some have tried to extrapolate the therapeutic hypothermia that has been found useful in newborn babies after hypoxia HK and catholopathy to the TBI group. And if you look at the meta-analysis, you see that people through the years have tried different ways of cooling, targeting different temperatures, different cooling durations, different rate of warming. But they have found that the risk actually increases, the risk of mortality actually increases with hypothermia, and they attributed this to the increased risk of cardiac arrhythmias. Now, if you look at the study, actually, it's mainly contributed by the Hutchinson trial. So let's look at that. This was a large randomized controlled trial, and they randomized to cooling versus normal thermia. Now, in this study, they found an unfavorable outcome at six months, with more hypotension and more vasoactive agents in the hypothermia group during the rewarming period. But you notice that in this trial, the rewarming was actually done quite quickly. So this was why others have criticized this study. Maybe they cooled too late, they cooled too short, they rewarmed too fast. So if we look at the Edison trials, we realize the first one, this was a phase two trial, showed a tendency towards improved uh, mortality with hypothermia, although this was not statistically significant. And ICD was significantly reduced in the initial 24 hours. But this was followed later by a phase three trial, where they improved on the methods, they cooled and maintained for 48 hours and ensured a very, very slow rewarming rate. The outcome measures would look at mortality at three months as well as neurological outcomes three months after the injury. What we do know now is that this study was halted for futility and they detected no significant differences in mortality. So Hutchinson went on then to do another meta-analysis which clearly shows, although not statistically significant, but the risk fell on the side of hypothermia. And he discouraged against the use of further RCTs to prove this point. So we do also have to remember that the effect of hypothermia uh, on drugs in that therapeutic hypothermia can decrease phenytoin elimination, increasing drug levels, and the risk of toxicity, and for uh, even a period that is extended beyond the time of Cooling. So with that, I think I've managed to cover most of the ground that we wanted to cover. And if we look at the literature, we realize, especially in those areas that we discussed that are relevant to the ED physician, a lot of the evidence is actually currently still quite low level. Okay? So this uh, places us at a position where we have many unanswered questions and a long road ahead to answer them. Thank you. I'm happy to take the questions.